Uh, let's get started. My name is David Nicoletti, and I'm Marketing Manager for Industrial Controls. And today we're going to have a webinar about pneumatic control systems. Uh, the presentation is going to take about 45 minutes. We're going to hear from two experts. At the end of the presentation, we're going to take some time and we're going to answer your questions. Um, there's two ways that you can ask questions. One way is if you look in your, your screen, there's a chat box where you can actually type in a question. And I can read the questions for you, and our panelists will answer them. Also, if you're on the phone line and not using a microphone, you can raise your hand using the interface, and then we can call on you, and you can ask your question. So we're going to wait until, until we're done with the presentation before we do those, though. Um, I'd like to introduce John Graham. He's a senior engineer at Industrial Controls, and he has close to 30 years' experience in the industry. In that time, he's worked with mechanical contractors and industrial and commercial customers, selecting discrete components and designing HVAC and industrial solutions. Uh, he has pneumatic and combustion experience and, and many areas of expertise in those. He did his undergraduate work at the Milwaukee School of Engineering. Um, also, I'd like to introduce Carl Johnson from Honeywell. He's a, co a commercial distributor rep, and he's been with them for 37 years. He was previously a new construction technician, service and installation manager, and a national accounts manager. Hello, Frank. Good. Carl graduated from the University of Illinois with a BS degree in industrial mm -hmm. education. Carl has his FAA, Airframe and Power Plant Mechanic License, FCC First Class License with Ship Radar Endorsement, and he's a certified energy manager. That's a good question. Um, so at this time, I'd like to pass it to John. You can double check right now. I know normally we get it off is to close and you close one or close lost. And on behalf of your friends at Industrial Controls, we'd like to welcome you to the first in a series of pneumatic seminars aimed at demystifying pneumatic controls. Today's seminar will be close right, to an hour when minus, and Carl and I are going to kind of trade off as we go to keep it conversational. Today's focus is going to be somewhat introductory, really. And we're going to begin with the uh, air supply, which is the motive force for pretty much any pneumatic system. Mm -hmm. We have tentative dates for the next three sessions, and they are April 21st. And we're going to be talking about uh, thermostats and controllers. Right. And if it's abandoned or inactive or closed, it doesn't show up. Devices, relays, actuators, and such. So abandoned, we're going to leave it there without having it show up on the open list. And then last of all, June 6th. Oh, you're welcome. So uh, if you forget the dates, just keep in mind it's going to be the third Wednesday of the next three months. That's probably the easiest way to remember that. So although the first pneumatic control system was patented by Warren Johnson 115 years ago, they are still quite viable. And when uh, the benefits of pneumatics are combined with today's DDC systems, you can leverage quite a bit. So with that, we're going to dig in, and I'm going to pass it along to Carl. John, thanks for the introductions. and. Uh we're going to try and move forward here, so bear with us as far as we're going to be advancing the next slide, so hopefully people can see that. Mm -hmm. And we do have a student uh, computer over on the other side. Everybody, Pneumatic Control Fundamentals Part 1. This Hello, morning. Mark Abraham. Sounds like... Uh, How you doing? Fine. Hopefully somebody can touch base with Mark uh, on that as far as listening to him on the telephone. Uh, for our objectives for this morning, we're going to be talking about major components of uh, pneumatic controls. And we're going to be looking at and understanding pneumatic terminology. I think uh, with any uh, new uh, type of thing that you're trying to learn, just getting the basic terminology down. And once you understand the terminology, and you then can move forward with that. So that's what our focus is, is for today. Also, we're looking at it from a service standpoint. Uh, and as far as what people will look at in fields with an existing installation, uh, and not really as a new or going at it from an application engineering standpoint. And we'll, we can a uh, answer some questions in regards to that, but that's really the focus is fire service, repair, and troubleshooting. So today we're going to be looking at the main air compressor in the mechanical rooms. Uh, we're going to be talking about the dryers that is going to be drying the air, and then looking at the pressure reducing valves that take the air pressure from the compressor and send it out to the rest of the building. And then after wrapping it up, we're going to talk about pneumatics in the marketplace and look at where pneumatics has come from and where pneumatics is going in the future. So I'm going to advance the next slide. 
and hopefully that's coming up on everybody's computer. Everybody should see the overview as far as seeing the compressor, uh, a refrigerated air dryer, and a picture of that, and also a picture of the filter stations and PRVs, and then also going out to the pneumatic thermostats. So I think a lot of times we look at pneumatic air supply sources and, and kind of skip over it. Everybody wants to start learning about what the thermostats do and what the controllers do. And we really want to focus today on the mechanical room and what goes on in that mechanical room because it's a really, really an important part of uh, any of the uh, pneumatic control systems in any building. And uh, so we want to look at these uh, individual items, make sure they're fully understood, and then also look at the risks uh, if we don't maintain them or if they're not looked at and repaired quickly, uh, we'll be going through those, uh, those topics as well. So we want to be able to supply a clean uh, air. We want to make sure that it's dry and oil-free and then make sure that it has an adequate volume. And then also we'll talk about the reliability and also when we put on ads and, and look at uh, different things as far as going through and walking through and doing job surveys, which John and I both do on a pretty regular basis. So we're going to be able to uh, hopefully impart some of what we do and uh, maybe you can also share during your question sessions what, uh, what questions you might have or what you do. Sure, so what we're going to do is start off with the compressor and uh, that's obviously our motive source for the system and when we think of compressor we think about it as a large module, a unit if you will, but it's really broken down or can be in, into another uh, couple of components. The one depicted on this slide is called a simplex, meaning it's only got one pump, one motor. Some compressors for redundancy will have multiple motors and pumps on one receiver, the receiver itself being just the tank. Hopefully you can see the mouse there. The uh, air comes in, as you would guess, through the filters at the top of the compressor, goes through a set of reed valves, and on an, every downward stroke of the piston we draw air in, as the crank continues to turn, we push the piston up. Another set of reed valves open and allow air to pass into the receiver. The cycle continues until the pressure switch is satisfied, and that's typically done at 80 to 100 PSI. The reason we do that is to store air at high pressure so that the receiver size isn't physically so large. The uh, problem points quite often are uh, limited to well, obviously uh, a problem with the motor, the belt, the compressor can be a number of things, really. But uh, we take air at high pressure, we pass it through the refrigerated air dryer, which we'll talk about in a, in a moment, through the regulator and out to the system. The compressor typically will run when properly sized at about a third of the time, meaning the duty cycle or run time, if it's on for five minutes, it should be off for ten. And that's done so that we extend compressor life. And uh, the, uh, the types of compressors typically, like depicted here, would be the reciprocating type, where you can actually see a piston moving, uh, if you were to take the head off, of course, or a rotary type or a turbine type. And another important thing to consider with compressors that are designed for comfort applications as opposed to pneumatic power tools and the type of stuff that you see at most uh, Home Depot stores and such is that these compressors are designed to turn very slowly so that we don't take a lot of oil out of the crankcase and vaporize it past the rings of the compressor and push it down into the receiver. So the lower the crank speed, the longer the life and the less aerosols, as they're called, pass through the compressor and into the system to be later extracted. There's a tank drain shown on the tank because obviously a natural byproduct of compressing the air is adding heat that heated high pressure air comes into the cool receiver and uh, you'll get a lot of condensate that needs to be removed there. So the automatic drain is there to do that. It can be float operated, meaning that you'll see a, uh, a float chamber with a valve and a needle and as the float becomes buoyant because of the water elevating in that, in that chamber, it'll discharge to a floor drain nearby. Some actually use a solenoid valve and a timer and the timer is set for a certain on and off duration and based on just an empirical setting of those on and off times, we arrive at some suitable amount of draining. And again, that uh, discharge to the floor drain. It's a pretty simple device, really, but it can't be uh, neglected only because it's mechanical and it's running 24-7, and it does require maintenance. 